It's up here. He's, you're going to start? And then, uh, okay. Then we'll just... Perfect. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. I can just leave that there so I don't... <laughs> Attention, please. Uh, very good evening to all of you. On behalf of the Consulate General of India, I welcome you all to this event, coffee event. Today we are here to taste one of the best coffees from India, Indian specialty coffee, that is Araku coffee. We'll know more about it. Uh, we have a coffee specialist, the Araku coffee mentor, Ms. Sherry Jones here, uh, who will tell how it is produced, how it is coming to the US market, and what is the taste of this coffee. To know more about what Government of India is doing to promote the Indian coffee and what Consulate is doing here, I would now invite Mr. Randhi Jaiswal, Consul General of, of India, to please address. Namaste, dear friends. Warm welcome. You know, we are living in a different age. We are living in times when everybody, industry, society, people, are looking for new forms of sustainability. How do we do things differently? How do we do more with less? And to answer all these questions, we have to look, forward, look towards Araku Valley. Araku Valley coffee is different from the point of view of environment, and Araku Valley coffee is different from the point of view of society. On that, of course, we'll hear more from our dear friend, Sherry Jones, who's as passionate about coffee as I am. Thank you very much for all his support. We had Danny at Javits Center rocking the show. In the last month or so, we've done several events around coffee. This is the third, in fact. We had participated in New York Restaurant Week with Araku Valley Coffee. Then we had three day at Coffee Fest at Javits Center in New York. And now we are here together to taste, smell, and experiment and enjoy Araku Valley, what comes from Araku Valley. Araku Valley, for many of you, let me tell you, it is situated in the eastern ghats of India, which receives a lot of rains. So it's a hot, wet climate. But as I told you, the speciality about Araku Valley coffee is that it is organic. And in this particular organization that Sherry is going to talk about, whatever is earned by way of profits goes back to the people who grow it. So that is what makes it makes the story so engaging for our customers and consumers here in the United States. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, let me also tell you that apart from coffee, this year we are also celebrating International Year of Millets. Millets are water-wise, health-wise crops, grains, gluten-free, superfood of the world, and a lot of millets are grown here in the United States as well. Sorghum is grown extensively in Texas. If we have more of sorghum here on our plates, we'll have less of obesity, less of health problems, and several other challenges that we all face together. So the answer for tomorrow lies in Araku Valley, and the answer for tomorrow lies in promoting millets and bringing more of millets on our plate. So with that, let me introduce our speaker, Sherry Jones, who's, uh, who leads an enterprise that is called whole cup coffee consulting, correct? She's from Portland, Oregon, Oregon, beautiful part of the United States. I haven't been there, but my friend stays there. Uh, she specializes in coffee. She's an international consultant, working, works with private industry, government agencies, NGOs, associations, roasters, retailers, consumers, and everybody who's engaged in the world of coffee. So she's, a, she's a coffee com specialist specializes in Araku Valley coffee from India, and as head 
of Gems of Araku Coffee Competition and Coffee Mentor. She works with a dedicated team providing, providing and improving the livelihoods of coffee farmers in a non-traditional growing region in the Eastern Ghats, that is Araku Valley in India. The first, she'll tell you more about it, the first Araku retail coffee opened in Paris. There is one in Bangalore in India, Bengaluru, as we call it today. And I'm told there's one to open in Japan soon. But Mumbai first, Mumbai first and Japan, but we have to get one here in New York because there's so many people waiting. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, she's a professional coffee cupper, and what excites me most is that she's called Cappuccino Queen. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. I really appreciate that. And uh, yes, I was handed the title of Cappuccino Queen um, quite a few years ago upon winning uh, one of the first recognized, or the first recognized barista competition in San Francisco. And that was probably in 1978. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I won first place three years out of four, and then I retired after that, um, and, uh, but uh, helped launch a little program called the WBC and Ultimate Barista Challenge following those enthusiastic years. And I'm still pretty excited about coffee. So thank you, lovely uh, introduction. First, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, as you can tell, it's gonna be all about coffee. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here, so thanks again, Sonal, if she's here. Yes, there, yes, thank you very much. And uh, for uh, kind of being the, the bridge here to get us, uh, get us in space in that. And thank you for the host. Okay, so shall we begin? All right, so here is our agenda for this afternoon. We'll start with some introductions. Then I'm going to help you understand where Araku coffee comes from and is really known as India's specialty coffee. Um, talk a bit about Nandi Foundation and introduce you to what uh, the work that Nandi Foundation does. Aska is the coffee school uh, that we have uh, begun in Bangalore. And uh, we'll talk about kind of the, for, for me it's about external market, like the global market, but all the external, let's say, global community of coffee, but it's also the local community too. So the school really helps to provide a lot of education and opportunities for um, Indians and Bangaloreans. Okay, um, I'll talk specifically about the Gems of Araku, which I am the head judge of that particular program. And we'll do a little sensory tasting exercise. There's not gonna be a quiz for you, so don't worry, but uh, I think you'll enjoy it and it'll be just fun for you to try coffees. I know you're all coffee lovers because you're here. So that's a, that's a first start. All right, and then we'll follow up with questions and answers. And then we have some uh, gifts for you. And you'll see that I've highlighted made in India, which is everything in the gift bag is made in India. So um, I hope you'll enjoy the coffee that's there and some a couple little surprises. So that'll be our agenda. Okay? All right. So introductions first. Um, in our audience head table, I'd like to introduce Danny Johns. Danny, stand up or wave, please. Danny is uh, also a coffee specialist. He is my partner. Yes, yes. <laughs> Very modest fellow, but <laughs> anyway, but uh, also a coffee, coffee lover and coffee professional. And thank you for your assist today. Secondly, I would like to introduce Mr. Mike Love. Mike Love is uh, a coffee roaster, a coffee cupper, and he is, um, he owns his roastery. He and his wife, Alicia, own their roastery in Terrytown called Coffee Labs Roasters. So he is here to assist today and he's also a big supporter. One of the international um, jury members for the Gems of Iraku and he has the, gem, what, the lot that you bid on online coming into your establishment here hopefully this week, right, Alan? Yes. Okay, it's on its way. But so if you really love the coffee of gems, you like to support a local fellow right here is Rossian. And then also his barista, Francesca, is in the back there waving. She is our, our barista today, brewing and serving. So thank you also from Coffee Labs. Okay, and so a little bit about myself. Okay, this is me in the competitions. But uh, I've been in coffee for, uh, let's say, 40 
plus years. I stopped saying the year because Danny's correcting me saying, no, don't say the years. I said, okay, so I'll just say 40 plus. Started as a, a young squirt barista. We didn't even call ourselves baristas. We just wanted to make great coffee and help people enjoy it. And uh, I really have never left. Um, it was an espresso bar, the very first espresso bar in the US on a campus in San Francisco. And I was known as their pickiest customer. Even though I was like 18, 19 years old, I would go in and say, well, when was this coffee brewed? And shouldn't it look like this coming from that thing? You know, and so I was really, even though we're all like 18, 19, 20 years old, I was known as their pickiest customer. I was also working in a record store and a music uh, bookstore. And we're working as in the counseling department. My degree was going to be in social welfare. I still kind of work with crazy people, just so you know. But uh, <laughs> coffee, you know. Uh, but anyway, that job was closing because of the summer, and the, the manager of that cafe said, listen, Cherry, you know a lot about coffee. Why don't you just work here? And it was on campus, and I'm like, that sounds good. She goes, all the coffee you can drink, too. And I'm like, I'm in. And so it was really quite by accident that I started working in coffee. And I can say honestly that I don't know if I found coffee or coffee found me, but I've never left, right? Um, I've done, uh, I helped launch a little company called Starbucks. And uh, yeah, yeah, they'd be OK without me now, but uh, helped launch that. Owned and operated my own cafe and roastery in San Francisco called The Blue Note, which was uh, named after a very famous jazz label. I'm a big music fan as well. And let's see. Um, well, uh, lots of different things like that. But I opened cafes throughout the world in Kuala Lumpur and Costa Rica, helped launch the WBC, which is a World Barista Championship. And I think that really came from me just being a young squirt and really you know, getting excited about winning a competition making coffee. And it was really, you know, it was quite different competition than what's today. But those sorts of things stay with you and they had an impact. And so, you know, who knew many years later, I would actually help launch kind of a global initiative uh, to get that off the ground, which really just recognizes and celebrates skilled baristas and helps propel them in the industry. So between that and owning my own place and Starbucks and opening the independence, um, I actually was with a program called the Cup of Excellence, which for 14 years working in maybe 11 different countries. Alan, you're very familiar with Cup of Excellence program, you as well. And it was really uh, you know, quite a joy and honor to be able to head, be head judge of that program because that really helped identify individual farmers, individual lots or plots of land and the quality that they're doing. Hey, Orin. Um, that uh, you know can rather than have all the coffees just be blended together and sold as a particular lot, these are individual estates. And so, I having uh, left a Cup of Excellence program or Alliance for Coffee Excellence, and was kind of headhunted by Araku. There was a, a Japanese gal who had studied coffee with me. She'd been on multiple juries with me for the other program, and said, "Listen, I'm working uh, buying some coffees from Araku Valley with this really amazing group." called Nandi Foundation, and I think you should talk to them. They host a competition, but we're really, you know, looking at bringing it kind of on a global nature, and I think you could help them out. I think you could lend some expertise. And I said, well, that sounds great. Um, I never choose the easy jobs. I'm just like that. <laughs> but I went there and, and met the group and just said, I, I believe that I could really help them. Um, they had good coffees. They had some very good coffees, and they had some average coffees. And I thought, well, let's really work with what we can and get things going with that. So that's just, that, that's about me. But it's all coffee, and I'm delighted to be here. So you never know where coffee's gonna lead you. You know, it really is not just a coffee business, it's also about people. So that's enough, enough about me. <laughs> okay, um, these I will say though are, are some of the students there, and then this is part of the cupping competition that we'll do. Okay, the story of coffee. You're gonna get a story today, guys. Um, Many people know how coffee was introduced in the world through uh, Abyssinia, which is now Ethiopia and Yemen. But there was a goat herder who one day couldn't find his goats. He looked all over the place, couldn't find them, and then he eventually found the goats, and they were kind of dancing and prancing and having merriment around these coffee trees. He didn't know they were coffee trees, but he noticed that they were eating these red cherries. And through that, he thought, well, if it's good enough for the goats, I'm going to give it a try. That's the short version here. Someone passing by, uh, the monastery noticed that this joy of life, and he decided to pick this fruit, right? Red cherries, because coffee is the seed of this red cherry, and take it back to the monastery. That's kind of the short version. In India, a little different story. A gentleman by the name of Baba Budan, he was a uh, 
as was 16th century Sufi, and he had been in um, on his way to Mecca and coming back, he found he loved this product, this drink that people were enjoying and decided to smuggle seven seeds into um, the country of India on his way back. And so there's a story, whether it was in his turban or whether it was in his beard or his walking stick, but that's really how coffee was introduced to India. And it would have been in the Chikmangalore area. And there is an er a, a very specific kind of a tribute, um, a cave. It's called the Baba Budan Caves, where people can actually go and kind of, that was kind of the birthplace of coffee in India. So that's a little bit of history for you. There's not going to be a quiz later, so don't worry. I just thought I'd bring some of this uh, historical, fun, folkloric information to you. Okay? All right. Where is coffee grown? Coffee is predominantly grown in this warm belt between the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer. So you can think about that shaded area. That's pretty much the coffee belt of globally. All right? A lot of countries produce coffee. A lot of countries can produce average quality, lower quality, good coffee, or amazing coffee. It's just how it's, uh, well, the cultivar, where it's grown, the elevation, how it's processed and that. But again, multiple countries produce coffee. Okay, uh, India is in the seventh position right now of the global production. A lot of that is taken into account is Robusta, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And they, they might be this year up in the sixth place. They seem to fight with Honduras a little bit for the volume of what they're growing. But, you know, top ten is always good as far as I'm concerned on there. So, okay. All right. Where is Araku Valley? People ask me that all the time. It's, you can see on the, the map here of India, it, the center one, it shows where Araku Valley is. It's in the eastern part of the country under the eastern guts. The department is called Andhra Pradesh, okay? And it is about a three hour drive outside of a, a city called Vizag for short. And I'll, I'll totally, you're laughing because you know I'm gonna mix up the name. Vizahapapnan, is that close? Say again. Okay, yeah, I've got a room full of coaches. I like it. <laughs> Vizak, like I said. Visa <laughs> Papnan, yes. And it really is a beautiful, beautiful area. A couple of scenes here, you can see this very windy road that takes you there, and then also the, the terrain. Uh, it's coffee country. They're also growing millets, they're growing avocados, mangoes, um, a lot of different fruits and vegetables there, too. They are. Um, producing some chocolate in that area too. We have some chocolate people here today, I know. Uh, but it really is a, a beautiful area. Um, and uh, even within that valley, not all coffees are the same. So that's one thing that's important to know because there is differences within specific villages and regions of these coffees too. But again, it's, I think it's a really hidden gem in the country. Most people in the rest of the world think of India coffee as predominantly grown in the south, uh, in the Karnataka area, Korg, and a lot of that is Robusta, okay? Uh, nothing wrong with that, that's a different market. Those, those plantations and farms have been in families for many, many years, and it's great that they're still sustained. Um, but predominantly in Araku Valley, it's a tribal people called Adivasi is their name. So it's important to know that these farms are owned, these are very, very small plots of land. Generally, they're a half an acre, no more than three acres. Um, and it's grown in the forest, a higher elevation, and it's typically farmed with the husband and the wife. Um, they're the owners of the farm, so which is very different than in coffees in the South or even in Central America, where a lot of times there are different people that are you know, harvesting or migrant workers running. These are the individual owners that have this land. In fact, no outsiders are able to have land in that area, able to own it. You have to be the Adivasi to own that. So, okay. Let's see here. Okay, just a quick, a quick clip here about the difference between Arabica and Robusta. Um, basically, Arabica is grown at a higher elevation. It grows more slowly. And those of you that are in the coffee business, you already know some of these things, but I'll help to bring it to the rest of the world, is that uh, Arabica has grown at a higher elevation. It grows more slowly because of that elevation. It's known as a specialty coffee, has less caffeine in it, and because it's grown at a higher elevation, it has more complex flavors. 
So the coffees you're tasting already and tasting for the, today are all Arabica, and they're all very specific coffees from uh, Araku Valley, the, the plots, the farmers that Nandi Foundation works with. Um, Robusta grows faster than Arabica. Uh, grown at a lower elevation, it actually has more caffeine in it. And it's typically, a lot of times it's used for instant coffee or for blending, things like that. So they're, you know, they're different worlds, different markets for both. I work only in the specialty world. Um, Nandi Foundation only has, works with Arabica specialty coffees as well. And there is a big difference. We won't have a tasting between both today. We're gonna have tasting of just really good coffee today. <laughs> so that's that, okay. All right, now some pictures of the valley itself. Um, it, it is very, very green. Um, the rainfall there is, in this particular area, um, Council General said, you know, it gets a lot of rain. These farms, just so you know, they are not um, plumbed. They are not uh, with um, irrigation systems. It's just the natural rainfall that supports these. And they, they get about 15 days of rain where it's still functioning when the monsoons come, pretty much the work has to stop. So every year there's new saplings put in, but they have to do that before the monsoons hit because otherwise it's just impossible to climb these steep hills. So, okay. All right. A um, little bit about the people there. As you can see here, this beautiful woman in the center here, she has her gold in her nose. This is characteristic of the Adivasi tribal women, and they are very proud of it. A lot of times this becomes heirlooms with their families. You know, they're passed on to their daughters and things. So you'll, you'll see that pretty frequently. Uh, gentlemen on the upper left and lower right, they are board members of uh, a cooperative that is managing the coffee processing unit. And they're also farmers themselves and owners. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. This is some of the local art that's there. It's very stylized. Um, you'll be happy to know that the binders in front of you, um, everybody gets to keep their binder. And there's some information in there too, but uh, some of it's a local art. And that uh, just a footnote, all of these things are made in India too. So nothing, uh, f nothing outside of the area. Ripe coffee cherries here. Um, coffee can only be picked when it's ripe red cherries. A lot of times the farmers will have to go to their coffee trees, or it's really a shrub, but they'll have to hike up to the hill to get there up to seven or eight times to pick the ripe red coffee cherries because they all ripen independently. Those of you that grow raspberries or tomatoes, um, you'll know that they don't all ripen at the same time. So it's really labor intensive to pick only the ripe red cherries. If they're picked, green or not ripe, they don't ripen after that. It's not like you can put them in a brown paper bag in a windowsill and they'll ripen like apples or bananas or pears. It doesn't work that way. So the information that they're given is really how to take care of the soil and how to grow the, you know, grow the trees and how to harvest the trees or how to harvest the cherries. This is um, where Nandi comes in. Nandi Foundation is an NGO, and they have one of the world's leading agronomists that works with them. His name is David Hogg, and he's kind of like my counterpart on the earth side. So he helps with the soil, the health of the soil, the nutrients that it's need. There are no fertilizers. There, there's nothing non-organic. Uh, the there are um, stations to produ produce compost throughout the valley where there's you know holes dug in the ground and there's certain yarrow and all different organic materials put in to make the compost materials. So it's really uh, a recipe, if you will. It's kind of David's magic uh, potion. And those things are produced, the recipe is given, they're produced locally and everybody, and it's, it's provided free of charge for the farmers. So those are some good things there. Okay. Foggy mornings, really beautiful. If you ever have a chance to go to Iraqu Valley, it's also a, a wonderful tourist spot too. I mean, because it's really kind of taking off. A lot of people from Vaisak go up there for holidays and the rest of India as well. But uh, in the morning, it's really chilly and foggy and just beautiful area. Okay. All right, some more pictures here. Um, the area itself is, coffee is their cash crop. Okay, a lot of times the farmers will use coffee as their, when the quality is there, they'll use coffee as their cash crop and then other vegetables, millets, pepper, you see here, this lower right picture, they're growing other products there too. Now the pepper actually is being sold as well right now. So there's like a container of it off to Europe. Hey, hi there. Uh, that's being sold as well. So it's pretty exciting agricultural area. Um, 
There is uh, silver pines, which are sh currently shade trees, but they're being eventually they're being replaced with a um, natural tree from the area as opposed to something that's from the outside. So there's a lot of work going on there. Okay. Let's see. All right. So talking a little bit, the first uh, location for Araku coffee was in Paris. And I think the logic was is if we can do it in Paris, we'll do it anywhere. This, the different than the New York version <laughs> that says if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. Is that right? Yeah, right. So, but that they decide, the board decided to um, open a, a spot in Paris, which is doing very well. And this is a second flagship. This is the first location in India. And this is something that I was involved with from the pre where it was a, a hole in the ground of dirt. but. Uh, Firstly, we had opened a roastery in Hyderabad, and that was, there was no retail element to it. It was a roastery, um, started a very modest uh, training center, which also was uh, recognized SCA coffee school, and also a wholesale started with that. So launched the website from there. Kind of the, the airport wanted their building back, and so he decided to open a, a regular flagship location, a full on cafe, restaurant, uh, training center, and roastery. And went to multiple cities, checked out Delhi, Mumbai, um, Bangalore, and really was determined that Bangalore was a great city. It's a foodie town. And in some ways, it reminds me a little bit of San Francisco because there's very distinct neighborhoods there. And there's also very kind of a sophisticated audience. Hi, welcome. Take seats, fine. Uh, very sophisticated group there that not only love food um, and clothing and kind of fashion things, but they really were, were because their love of food and flavors, I personally just felt it was the best spot to open a cafe. So we opened something there. It was um, a year in the making for the design. I did all the design of the, it's, it's another thing I do, is a design cafes. But, it, but all the designs of the coffee stations were something that I laid out for the board and got approval on and helped them understand the value of that. The, um, in the center there, there's something called a mod bar, which is like you have the element of brewing espresso, but it's below the counter. And so the idea is for more engagement. Because for me, coffee is really about engaging and it's about people and getting together. So it's something called the mod bar. Uh, as you enter the cafe, you can, your first entrance is a mod bar. Directly behind it, I can see I've got a picture of the school that somehow migrated from the corner to the center there. That's okay. Um, but behind it is another espresso bar. We have something called the sensory bar that's not in the photo, but it's a place where any of the customers can go in and learn about how to brew coffee, how to do pour overs, Chemex or V60, or even there's a, a mocha pod, like a stovetop espresso machine that they can um, try and, and taste that coffee from that too. So it's really called a sensory bar. Um, up the stairs is where you'll see the coffee school. Now, on the upper left is the frontage of the cafe itself, just called Araku Coffee. So we've got two things going on. We've got the competition, we've got working with the farmers, helping educate and support them. We've got the competition itself of the Gems of Araku. And then we have the flagship location in India, where we do not only sell coffee and have you know a full, full on, uh, very eclectic, organic food menu, but also it's where the coffee school is as well. So it's up, but here's a facade, upstairs, and then here's the school. Now it's, we don't have, all, it's not in action at the moment, it's in between classes, but we do all the um, cupping classes there and we do quite a few different activities all around coffee. You can see the coffee roaster in the back. It's roasted on a 12 kilo Probat, a German roaster, and we have a couple of gentlemen that are roast about roast masters, but lead roasters that take care of all the online orders and the wholesale orders and uh, the cafe. So all the coffees in the cafe are actually roasted in-house. And of course, these all come from very specific areas in Iraq Valley. Okay. The school itself, we call it Asuka. I, I just did all the design and layout and the materials, but uh, they, marketing people came up with the Oscar and they thought it sounds like the Oscars. So I'm like, yeah, sure, that works. But it stands for Araku World Specialty Coffee Academy. So there you go. All right. Okay, so some of the activities in the school, you can see what the different courses that we offer there. There is something called the Coffee 101s, which are, I, I, I tell people a lot, it's a two hour every Saturday, and it's a great date. You know, bring your friend, bring your spouse, or husband, wife, and uh, or date, and come for these two-hour things. They're very, it's very specific 
titles. We have, let's see what's on here. Oh, Snap, Crackle, and Pop is about roasting. Um, the, let's see, we have writing workshops and that. Grind, Dose, and Tamp is like home barista. So there's, there's short topics, and so these are called Coffee 101. So they're really fun, and people like those a lot. And then on the, S, on the Specialty Coffee Association side, those very specific classes can be either in barista, in roasting, or a sensory. And I teach the, the barista classes and the sensory. And there's three levels of those. And those can go anywhere from one day to three days, depending on if it's a foundation or intermediate. And these courses are actually accredited by the global organization called Specialty Coffee Association, which is kind of a big deal. Um, the professional barista is just starting, just getting started, let's say, in Bangalore. And people are really understanding that there's some value in having uh, an, uh, kind of a formal education in coffee, all right? And understanding how they can talk about taste and how you can make drinks and really help customers enjoy the coffee and learn about it, all right? So those are the classes that we offer there. All right, let's see. Yeah, some of the students here. And also uh, of the 101 classes, the coffee 101s, I have um, a handful of the baristas that are actually teaching those. We have one that's also coffee mocktail, and there's shaken and stirred. It's about ice brewed. And so certain kind of lead baristas or shift manager baristas are teaching some of these smaller classes too. One of my jobs is, and also goal, is not only as head judge of the Cup of, of the Gems of Araku uh, program, but also to help develop and mentor the baristas and help them get more skills and confidence and share their knowledge too. So that's really an important part of, and uh, in, in pride of what I like to do as well in the coffee world. Okay, all right. Now, a um, little bit more about SCA courses. Um, again, it's, these are accredited courses by the Specialty Coffee Association, which is a global organization. I'm sure you guys already in the coffee world know, know all about this program, but it's a, it's a pretty good group. It's a professional trade group, and uh, so happy to be certified as one of their trainers, and really was delighted to be, have our campus be the very first uh, certified SCA campus in India. So that's pretty darn cool, I say. So, very excited about that. Okay, any questions so far? Am I talking too fast? <laughs> okay, Indians talk fast too. Uh, you know, I haven't even really had much coffee today. I had like one cup and I had a few sips of, the, of Danny, your cup in the back there when you weren't looking. But uh, I'm kind of like this, guys. <laughs> but it's coffee, that's what motivates me. It's exciting stuff. All right, so. Ah, the opportunities, and this is something, again, going through the classes, we just had um, internet, was it International Women's Day, and so we had a, uh, an open house at the cafe and just talked about opportunities as baristas or as coffee roasters or different ways where people can get involved in the industry. And so these were just some of the ideas that I put up and we talked about how do you get involved in some of these things. And you know, really you should, do what you're passionate about, and you'll find a niche that you can, you know, hopefully uh, get uh, be sustainable yourself if you follow kind of your love or your passion. It's totally possible. In India, the coffee scene is really blowing up. It's expanding so much, um, and it's really exciting for me to see that market grow and to see the opportunity for some of the young, you know, younger adults um, get excited about something and then feel that they have a future in that too. Are you guys a barista? Are you baristas? No? Not yet, huh? Hmm. <laughs> so, but it's pretty cool to see, you know, every time, in fact, every uh, last time I went, I, I just got back from India a couple of days ago, and uh, we're in a particular area, a 12th in Maine, if anybody gets back to Bangalore, please contact me and I'll send you to the cafe. With any luck, I'll probably be there and I'll make your coffee and we'll have a great time, Cake talk. But. Uh, I had to laugh because this time when I went back, there's like a Starbucks right down the street. I'm like, well, oh, that's a good sign. They followed us, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, it was pretty pleased with that, actually. But it brings more people to the area. And you know what? The market is so huge. There's, there, everybody has their own taste. And the, the best news is that the more places open and are dedicated to serving quality, the more sustainable and even past sustainable that we can help farmers be farmers, right? And grow good quality. So that's really uh, important. Okay, now let's see. So some of the, some of the students here, um, we've hired a couple of the really great students actually. They're like, oh, that's really great. You can go ahead and maybe start brewing this, this next one. Yes, please. 
So, um, but some of the gals there, the one on the left wants to open her own cafe someday. And she's one of the barista leads and came through the classes, right, SCA classes. So this is her brewing here. Uh, the gal in the center top, her family is actually uh, farmers. So they, act, they live, I think, in Arizona right now, but she's looking forward to learning as much as she can um, and to take those skills back to the farm and really bring the farm to the next level. She wants to plant um, Arabica there and really get into that. And that's exciting. You know, when you have young people that want to go back to the farm, it's, it's a big deal, you know, it really is. And that's what's happening in Araku, too. Another student, a couple of students there. So, that's right. All right, okay, now, the gems of Araku. So, this is a whole different thing, okay? We've got the retail world, and we've got the green world, I'll say. And they're both really great worlds, and I'm really happy to be kind of a rare bird that I can kind of live in both worlds. Um, the Gems of Araku is a Nandi initiative. Nandi Foundation is an NGO that is head offices are in Hyderabad, and they have a multitude of projects that they work on. Um, there is a girls' school called Nandi Kali that they fund and, and uh, they finance these schools for the girls. There's a sports program where they have, you know, young teenagers, adults, uh, boys and girls. They have volleyball tournaments. They have they have a person who was one of the winners of one of the Olympics somewhere that she comes and she coaches. And so they have, every year they have these competitions. And uh, it's really cool to see these young kids that, you know, maybe they don't have an opportunity, but man, they're really great sports. They're runners or they're jumpers and they're playing volleyball and they're just prospering in that or they're just thriving in that environment. So that's really great. There have been um, water projects. Um, Nandi first got involved in Araku Valley because it lacked uh, medical facilities, and it had one of the highest um, illiteracy rates and also a birth death rates in the country, in that area. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Manoj Kumar had gone to that area and realized that there was so much potential and he felt that he could really lend some expertise. And I think he visited that area about three years before anybody would even talk to him, you know, because it's an Adivasi group, very shy kind of people until you get to know them. Like most, you know, like most uh, people, they're somewhat isolated. The area also, uh, and sometimes still, is inhabited by um, Mao's terrorists, Nexal. So that was also kind of an, uh, an area where I can, I can tell you truthfully that an area when there's economic stability, farmers will make better decisions, they'll make good decisions. But when you don't have food on the table and somebody comes to your area and says, hey, you know, uh, we'll take care of you, we'll give you food, but you need to do this for us, you know? And that doesn't exist when this, through the coffee program and the, the money that the farmers are getting for growing the quality coffee, the farmers are perfectly happy, right? They're, so they don't have to worry about some of these things. They still kind of do, of course. But I mean, again, the people that were the bad people have basically been pushed out of the area and they're not there. And it's because of the economic stability and the skill set that they've gained from working with Nandi and learned these things. And it was never about these are bad people, we're good people. It was about let's help you prosper and understand how to grow better quality coffee because that's your cash crop and that's where you know the livelihood can come from. So. Going into the GEMS program, it was started probably, I think it's 14th year now, and it was a program to identify very special lots, very really unique high quality coffees, and, take, and, and sell them, sell them as independent recognized lots, okay? Most of these lots, the farmers, they own either a third, well, a half acre, no more than three. Uh, so again, these are very small. I mean, the size of this room is, is probably just one farmer and that's what they've got, you know? So the idea is that when you're harvesting your coffees, you may only have 26 kilos. You may only have just a small amount from your production for that season, right, or that year. And so these lots have been isolated um, based upon uh, the, the, the bricks level of the cherry. That's how much sugar is in the coffee cherry itself, right? So they've been isolated by the, whether it's a deep red, crimson red color, or just a really good red color, um, and then the bricks meter. So when, okay, you're working with 22,500 coffee farmers, and if each farmer is processing their own coffee, how many different processes do you think you have? <laughs> yeah. 
22,500. So, so Nandi went ahead and built what's called a coffee processing unit. For those of you in Central America and been around, it's also called um, the uh, pulping station. In Africa, it's a washing station, so you know, where the coffee cherry is delivered and then it's processed, right? Processed in various ways. So Nandi funded this uh, building. It's beautiful, beautiful. It's one of the cleanest I've ever seen, truly. And it's managed by a cooperative that had been elected by the local people that manage it themselves. So they're given the expertise, but yet they manage it themselves. And it's called the, uh, let's see, Small Marginal Farmers Association, like that. And so when these coffee cherries are coming in, they're looked at the quality of the cherry, the color of it, of course, the bricks reader. And so a gentleman by the name of Vinod is actually kind of lending expertise that sets some of these lots aside. Okay, so these lots as they're set aside, then they, they get cupped by me, and there's a first what we call pre-selection round, and then it goes through several stages. All right, so I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we're going thing here. So I was actually brought into uh, Nandi Foundation as introduced really as, as a head judge to take over this program and kind of bring it to the next level. And it just kind of, as soon as Manoj figured out that I knew retail as well, he goes, okay, you're doing the store too. I'm like, okay, that sounds great. <laughs> Which was a year in the making and we opened two weeks before COVID shut us down, but <laughs> we survived. <laughs> so, okay, back to Jim's. So shade grown coffees, a regenerative agriculture, and it's all, it's certified organic, all right? It's also certified fair trade, that's important. On the trees in the back, you can see kind of these, right here, this is peppers growing up, uh, growing alongside the, the trunks of the shade trees. And then obviously these are coffee uh, plants here, and they're not quite ripe yet, they're picking the ripe cherries only, okay? So, oh, here I am with the coffee farmers, the ladies. A lot of women own these farms, a lot of husbands and wives. Some places don't even allow the women to own land. This is not the case here. This is all jointly owned, let's say. Okay, now, the gems, okay. So, quality standards of the gems. These special lots are isolated. Now, I, so Vinod will pick out 900 lots that he thinks are pretty good. It gets narrowed down to 395 lots. This is this year, 395 lots to me. So the last, I've been in India for the last month cupping coffees. Cupping is a term that professional tasters use to evaluate the quality of coffee. So my last month has been cupping 395 lots of coffee. <laughs> Multiple cups of the, each sample, by the way, too. Each sample is coded. As you can see on the top here, code number 43, the 10% is a moisture count, and then um, talking a little bit about the processing on those. But so when I cup these coffees, I don't know where they're from. I don't know the, I, I wouldn't be able to even say the name of the village. <laughs> so, but there's seven mandals that Nandi works with. Of that, there's multiple villages in each, uh, in each region, right? Or in, and so those are isolated as individual lots. I cup each lot and score it on a one to 100 point source system. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But of the 395 lots, what? Yes, please. Uh, just about, just about. He's, you're ready for, I know you smell the coffee, you're ready for your next round. Don't worry, it's coming. So I cup the lots. Um, of the 395, I got the top 40. All right, of those top 40, then I brought in other cuppers. So we have like a national jury. It's the second phase of the competition. We cup top 40. Each coffee is still coded, right? We don't know, it's, it's got a three digit number on there. So we don't know where it's from or who's involved with it. We just cup it and evaluate it, right? So now we've just finished the top 20. That was my, my uh, I did back to back. I did the pre-selection phase and then the, the national phase, I'll say, and now we're going on to the international phase. So we have the top 20 now. So in, let's see, four weeks time, May 1st through 5th, I'll have international cuppers join me in Bangalore and we'll cup the coffees again and then we will go to Araku Valley and we'll have an awards ceremony there, Harvest Festival, and those coffees that rank of the top 20, they'll be ranked and they'll be sold online in the, in the, to international buyers from all over the world. Uh, Mike Love has bought a lot from last year, he'll be bringing it in 
and they're just getting the next round of coffees for you, uh, bringing it in, and uh, we'll, we'll see if you, so he's in Terrytown, so if you guys are local, that would be a place to go get gems. Okay, so you see the cups on the table here? How we're cupping is that we, the coffees are roasted to a very specific profile. We're doing a roast check up here so that I make sure each individual sample is prepared exactly the same. When we are cupping coffees, for me it is my, my duty to ensure that each cup is treated exactly the same. The coffee beans are weighed independently, even though it may be three cups of the same coffee, they're weighed independently and then ground independently. If we simply took shortcuts and say I have 11 and a half grams, for three cups, if I did the math and just ground it and scooped it in there, one bean that's a defective bean might get lost in that, right? Might get blended out or I wouldn't perhaps taste it, identify it. So we weigh each individual cup as the beans, all right? And then the grinder is purged, you run the cups through. Very specific, it's, it's very strict protocol for this competition because if a coffee scores amazingly or it scores very good or average, it has to be because of the coffee. It can't be because maybe the cup was poured differently or the grind was off or the, the person helping me, assisting with the program wasn't you know, paying attention. So every single thing we do has to be for the coffee itself. Okay, so it's very strict protocol there. You see some of the cuppers here, okay? so. Nanolots, nanolots is a kind of a special little deal too because in these cuppings of 395 coffees, there's some really amazing little coffees and the thing is to make it, uh, to make it be where uh, somebody could actually buy it and, and uh, you know, enjoy it, these are such small lots it would be very hard to auction but they're just so sweet I couldn't stand to blend it so I said let's do nano lots. So you'll find some nano lots that are just individual. After we cup them and they're scored only then do I see what the weight is on these coffees and then I can tell you that the, the Coffee number one and two first place of these 395 coffees that I tried were both nano lots. So it's like, ugh, we're, we can't blend these, they have to be independent. So that's a nano lot for you. All right, now, this is some of the information of one of the lots from last year. Okay, so this information is on the website called Gems of Araku and we'll be updating it with all of the coffees of the top 20 that are coming along. Okay, so this is the kind of the information. Now, there were 90 farmers on this individual lot. Okay, so 90 families um, on this one particular lot. This is just a husband and wife team that are, are part of those 90 people that are on it. So it's pretty cool. So it'll talk, so the website itself talks about our cupping notes, um, about the information of the village and the area, the varietal and the process. Okay, I know it's a lot of information for you. Don't worry, there's not gonna be a quiz. Okay, this is another lot. Um, this one was a nano lot. Nine farmers from one village contributed to this making. So these are all really amazing little, you know, sweet little lots. Um, typically on any, like the cup that you're being served now is called selection. And that actually is um, a, a blend of washed coffees, of honey process and also natural coffees. So this one is called Selection. And that one, there's I think 50 farmers on that blend. And that's what's featured in the cafe. It's just past, j harvest is just finished and we're just in the competition phase now. So I don't have any of the competition coffees for you, but this is one of the ones that is served in the cafe. And I, I think you'll like it. You guys are smiling. You just being polite or do you like it? <laughs> All right. So tasting notes on that one. All right, so um, just a little bit about the, the competition itself, some of the international jury members. This is the lots that, just a snapshot of the lots that sold this past year in May at the auction, online auction called Gems of Araku. So you can see the prices here. I mean, these are amazing prices. And Nandi takes no commission for any of these sales. Okay, so what happens is the coffee cherries are purchased um, at the coffee processing unit by Nandi. If they want to sell them to Nandi, now they do. Nandi pays about six times what everybody else pays for the qualities. They don't just buy anything, but they pay six times as much. Those farmers are actually paid within 15 days, which is unheard of in coffee world. You know, Alan, you know this one. I mean, it's just sometimes the importers or exporters will wait till the coffee is sold before they pay the farmer. These farmers at Nandi, they're paid within 15 days, 
And Nandi actually helped open savings account for the farmers too, because it was a pretty much a barter system before they really got the coffee ramped up to be able to sell it a you know sell a quality product pretty much a barter system so what happens when you're not used to money or like when you're you know your first job you get a paycheck you go buy shoes <laughs> so the farmers you know didn't really know how to manage it so nandi really helped support them not changing the culture by any means but helped support them to learn about how to save and how to plan for you know weddings and different things activities in their lives with that Okay, but this is an example. And so all of this money, the farmers have already been paid for their cherry, but if their coffee makes it up to the finals and it's sold online, all this goes back. So this would be divided in that particular village or of those farmers that are on that lot. So it's really pretty, uh, a pretty, tra it's very transparent program and it's really pretty impressive that the farmers are getting this much money for the quality on there. So it's really nice. All the education uh, is provided free of charge that Nandi does. Um, the farmers can sell their coffee to Nandi or cherry to Nandi if they want or sell it to somewhere else. But, uh, but that's what really struck me too is that they're willing to put so much into this and then I was really excited when I was invited to, you know, help be the head judge of this program um, because I think that, you know, the coffees are very special and I think that m the rest of the world doesn't quite understand that India can produce amazing specialty coffees. And the fact that it's really going back to a tribal community that is doing well with, you know, that, that can do well um, and be very sustainable with that. So it's really, uh, I like it. All right, let's see. Um, yeah, buyers here, you've got Korea, Japan, UK, Germany, Thailand, Emirate, I think is in, oh, let's see, I think they're in Dubai maybe. Oh, Australia, sorry, Australia. So, but, but we have roughly 13 to 15 international buyers. Again, Mike Love in the back here, the USA representative, buying a gems lot last year. The international jury member, remote. <laughs> so are you gonna come this year, Mike? Yeah, okay. Okay, you'll try. That's, that's all right. We'll come here to get the coffee from you once it's roasted. Okay. Um, this is the top 10 so far for this year. Now, again, this has, the international jury hasn't ranked these yet, but this just gives you an idea of the process uh, of it. Natural, black honey, washed, and then some of the, the flavor notes, right, or tasting notes. Whiskey barrel, ripe apricot, juicy. Juicy is very, you know, really rich, just full. <laughs> Uh-huh, I heard somebody talk about whiskey barrel. I've heard rumors that that's how it tastes. Not that I know anything about whiskey. No, it's really, these are, some of these are just exciting coffees, guys. You know, if you are interested in the coffees, you can also buy a sample set online, which is like 100 grams of green coffees, you know, something like that. So, but it's pretty cool. You can check out the website, just to give you an idea. Okay. Um, we did a harvest tour this year. Coffees typically begin to be harvested in October and as late as March. So um, I was there with, with some of the buyers and obviously some of the, the local Adivasi as well and some of the Nandi support team and that was really exciting to do. So. It's, it's a whole different part of India. You know, people sometimes have, uh, they don't really understand the country itself, but I really think it has a potential in this area to be like the breadbasket of what, uh, you know, can be possible. All right, let's see now. Okay, some more pictures of the ladies with their gold here. Okay, all right. The first coffee you were served, let's see here now. Oh, this is a 90 support team. So this is David in the center. Um, he actually is a Kiwi or he's a New Zealander, went to go surfing in uh, India in 1974 and never left. And he is now one of the world's leading, has been for a few years, one of the world's leading agronomists that, uh, you know, helps support that. Uh, Anupama, just to his right, um, she heads up the GEMS program and, and then all the different supporters here. Manoj, the one in the front with the little Korean heart. Everybody know this means heart, right? Yeah, and if you, if you do this, it means the heart is beating. Yeah, okay, in the Korea. So, uh, but everybody's really happy. <laughs> it's, it's these, it's like a beating heart. Yes. <laughs> you travel, you learn these things. And then the heart cart. But anyway, so it's a, it's a nice, 
we call it a harvest festival because it's not just about the gems of Araku, it's celebrating the entire harvest. We have the volleyball championship there. We have the village that has most improved, maybe one that's been in transition for organic status and they've recently achieved that. So they, it's really all about the celebration of the harvest and all the different things going on. So the gems is kind of a small, it's called the gems of Araku, but we as, as the cuppers, we're kind of just a small portion of that. It's really more about the, the work that the farmers are doing and, and celebrating that. Okay, let's see. Here's some more of the jury members. All right, and this one. This is only part of the attendees. The award ceremony, we had 4,000 plus farmers come to it. Amazing. Yeah, you've been to COE ones. I don't know if you ever had 4,000, maybe in Burundi, but no, this is pretty incredible. And it was in this open grove of mango, 100-year-old uh, mango trees. And it was really quite, quite impressive area. And so they come from, you know, all parts of the valley to just cheer each other on. And it's very different, you know, when somebody, you know, wins, everybody claps for them. They're all excited for it too. And it's really quite, quite the ceremony. So this was uh, last year's picture, and I think this year will probably be even more bigger, probably 5,000 as opposed to that. But it's pretty exciting. Okay, so uh, to the global buyers, um, Japan and Korea there. So both uh, uh, gals that own their own companies and they are just very excited about providing Araku coffee, gems of Araku coffee to their clientele. And uh, it's really a big hit in Korea. You know, so it's great. Yeah, and, and I think we'll have the Tokyo store at some point. So, okay, just introducing there. Um, a little bit about how coffee is processed, and I'll, I'll be uh, quick through this. Um, basically, three types of processing for coffee. There is wet processing where the coffee cherry is pulped. The seed is separated from the fruit itself, okay? They're washed in a fermentation tank. They're dried on open patio, okay? Um, the patio, drying patios are elevated tables, all right? This is the short version. I won't turn it into a whole coffee or education. That'll be on my next one. I'll come back and do a coffee class for you guys. Yeah, you can. I'm in. Um, so the wet process, all right? Um, there's also called something called a honey process, where only the skin of the coffee cherry is removed, and that mucilage that's on the coffee bean itself is just loaded with sugars. Think about like watermelon seeds, you know how it's really slippery and it kind of you know, flies out of your mouth if you let it. Um, that's, a, that's called mucilage. So on the coffee bean, there's quite a bit of that mucilage, and so by just removing the skin, those coffee uh, beans then, or seeds, are left to dry with that mucilage, what that does, it imparts a lot of sweetness into those beans themselves. So that's called the honey process. Now, you might see somebody offering black honey. Black honey is one of the coffees that we have on their list. Um, those coffees have that mucilage on it and they're drying, but what um, Vinod does at the coffee processing unit, he actually takes mucilage that's been separated from the wet processed coffees, kind of makes a slurry out of it, and then applies it on the already honey process. So it's like a double dose of the honey on that, and it's called black honey, okay? Uh, let's see, dried or natural processed coffees are the fruits. Um, yeah, we can go ahead and brew the second one, sure. Um, are the, where the coffee fruit itself is allowed to dry fully on the coffee seed, and then it's winnowed off, okay, or, or taken off, okay? So, let's see here. Ah, here's some of the table drying. Sorry, that's a little blurry there. All right. So you can see, and these gals, they're, at general, they're farmers themselves, but they come and they work part-time during harvest time, so they kind of help out. They get paid for this as well, um, but they're actually very gently stirring the coffee cherries so that they dry evenly. Too thick of bed in these drying tables, they might get moldy underneath, and once the coffee is moldy, it's a defect, it's not sellable. So they're very gently all day kind of rake these coffees. But again, these, they have farms themselves, or their families have farms, small farms. That is a cloth. Yeah, and then it's a screen underneath the tables. Okay, just some more pictures of lovely farmers. All right, oops, oh yeah, here we go. So I like to say there's roughly 20 sets of hands that touches every coffee before it gets to the customer. All right, so just kind of a little cherry to cup image like that. All right, roast degree, 
Um, how coffees are roasted, uh, the job of a roaster is kind of like the chef of coffee. So they really have to respect that coffee bean and really find its sweet spot. All right, is that right, Michael? That is correct. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Just see if you're paying attention. But really, you know, so what happens is these coffees really represent the elevation, their tawa, the, how much sun they get, how much uh, cloud cover they get every day, the cultivar that it is. And then once those are processed, then it's up to the roaster to find that sweet spot. So these subtle nuances happen when you've got a combination of temperature, airflow, and time. Those are the, that's the short version. Michael will give you the long version of it later if you want to stay after class there. But it's the combination of that. And so the, the people roasting the coffee, it's their, their job and their excitement to find that sweet spot of the coffee. Those subtle nuances will be cold out as you're being roasted. At a certain point though, what happens is if you continue to roast the coffee, you burn off those subtle nuances and then you begin to taste the roast process itself. So it's a different thing. At Araku, in, in the cafe, we don't do dark roast. There's a medium, medium dark, and that's it. Don't go past that, because we want you to still taste the coffee, not taste the roast. Make sense? So, and just some of the tools there that we're using. All right. Okay, now, tasting and sensory experience. 80% of what you taste first comes through your nose. That's your factoid for today, okay? So 80% of what you taste first comes through your nose. All right, and this is true. It's medically proven, yes. Michael is demonstrating the nose back there. <laughs> is it I know this or just the nose? <laughs> yeah, the nose knows, that's right. That's absolutely right. So let's see, right, and this is just where it comes, orthonasal, retronasal, all right, oops. So that's kind of that slide. All right, next is, uh-oh, hmm. Hmm, the next one, there we go. Where is flavor perceived? Now, sweet, sour, salt, bitty, bitter, umami uh, is a kind of a fifth taste bud. That would be more like mushrooms or maybe kind of a soy sauce kind of a flavor. But those taste buds are located at different portions of your mouth. And as you taste coffees, for cuppers, we will slurp it in really loud, and we slurp it in for two reasons. One is we want to aerate it and cool it off slightly because we don't want to burn our palate. If we burn our palate, we can't taste anymore for about 10 days, which is really important if, you know, if you're on a timeline. So you slurp it in, that's why we do that, uh, to fully coat your palate because your taste buds are located at different concentration levels within your mouth. So to cool and then also make sure you're tasting your whole palate. Okay, all right. Now, okay, so you started with your first tasting you had a coffee called Selection. Selection is a cup that is, is three different processes blended together. Uh, it's washed, natural, and honey process. That coffee actually is designed, actually create that blend, designed to really be full bodied, very kind of toffee, caramel, maybe some milk chocolate notes to it. Um, just, I hope you tasted some of those things. Um, generally, if you thought it was a good cup of coffee, that's, that's okay too, because consumers can always, given two cups of coffee, people can tell which one they like. Sometimes roasters underestimate coffee tasters or consumers, but they will always be able to tell you what they like best, okay? So that was your first tasting coffee. The next coffee that's coming around now, it's from a, an island. It's in Araku Valley, of course, and it's a group that Nandi works with. So it's unlike any of the other Araku coffees, perhaps, that you've had experience to. But this is from a, an island that has about 100 farmers. They don't live on the island. They actually take small boats out to the island to farm the coffee. So this, we call it microclimate because it's very small amount that's grown there and it's a natural process, so it's 100% natural. So this one, first, first challenge for you is can you tell that it's different from the first cup you had? That's your first, that's your easy exercise, okay? And then secondly, ideally you should be able to taste kind of fruit notes to it, like maybe raisins or plums or dates. Just see if it has some of those characteristics. But again, first note, first, first taste, is, does it taste different than the first coffee you had? But so these are kind of tasting exercise for you. And Michael is serving now your second cup. Some of the characteristics we look for, body, flavor, acidity, balance, complexity. And I'll give you just a little brief 
a brief intro, body is the viscosity of that coffee. So a heavy bodied coffee might be round, it might be full bodied, it might be syrupy. A light bodied coffee might be thin, all right? So that's body. We talk about the viscosity, how it feels on the tongue. Now flavor, flavor is generally the easiest notes for people to look at because they can identify if they, if they love chocolate, are there chocolate notes in it? Or is it, you know, um, I don't know, floral? Certain characteristics that you've tasted already previously in your life, you might be able to draw upon that and recognize some of those things. Dried apricots, you know, different, different flavors like that. So that's flavor. Acidity, I like to say acidity is coffee's most misunderstood component because it adds life or brightness. Most common acidity is um, citrus. So there might be like lime citrus or orange, bright citrus notes in the coffee, acidity, okay? Second most common acidity in coffee is either malic or tartaric. So think about tartaric as green fruits, malic is red, okay? Once you get accustomed to that, then you're able to identify it. A lot of, uh, oftentimes, and I do call it coffee's most misunderstood component, because people sometimes will say, oh, I don't like acidity, it upsets my stomach. It's a different type of acidity, it's a different type of pH. Um, good acidity is bright and lively and can add sparkle or life to the cup. Bad acidity is sour. That's, that's really what it is, so. Um, it's a good thing. Good quality acidity is bright, lively, bad quality, bad quality is just sour, low quality coffee, okay? Balance. Now balance for me is within that category. Let's say you got a pyramid, you got body flavor acidity. Think about a pyramid, not the heart, but pyramid. Um, do those characteristics, do those qualities support one another or do they compete? Maybe a coffee has wonderful flavors, right? But, they're, but it's really flat, there's no acidity to it. It's not gonna be balanced. Okay, maybe a coffee has really nice acidity, but there's not much flavor to it, so that wouldn't be a balanced. So think about those characteristics and how do they support each other? Do they complement or do they compete? So that's really balance, okay, in the coffees. Complexity, the cup you're drinking right now is probably, should be pretty complex for you. A lot of different things going on in the cup. Okay, and then finish. Finish is, as a coffee taster or a coffee enjoyer, finish is after you s swallow it um, or spit it out, depending on you know, your activity that you're doing at the time. What's it like? Is it pleasant? Does it taste good? Does it linger in your palate? And that's really called finish. Okay, a lot of similarities to wine tasting in coffee world. We're just a lot newer <laughs> in the coffee world. Okay, even with tea world, there's a lot of similarities with tasting. Yeah, okay. Any comments on these coffees? Observations? Yes. I had a question. Uh, yeah. Regarding Arabica selection number nine. Yeah. Is that a company label or designation? Or no, that's that. Um, uh, that's a designation that was uh, introduced by the Coffee Board of India. So selection nine is probably the most common. Selection three nine five is another one. You don't really see any geisha coming from there yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Uh, cultivar is it's all Arabica, and then Selection 9 would be the variety. Am I explaining that correct, Alan? Yeah. Okay. So there's a pretty active coffee board there too. So a lot of times these saplings or these seeds um, might have been introduced back when the coffee board, um, you know, was working with all the farmers there and bringing more uh, varietals in. But those are the two most common. You'll find Tipica also, uh, but again, you don't find some of the, the ones that you'll see elsewhere in the world, you don't necessarily find those in India yet. Okay, good question. You, somebody else had their hand up too. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's placebo, but I feel like I could taste the chocolate, so that was really good. Oh, good. Um, so could you elaborate a bit about how the introduction of like how that translate? Oh, thanks. Uh, how that translate in, translates into something that's useful for them? Feel like the farm. Uh, useful for them? Well, one of the yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think did you guys hear her question? Just how does money fit into the scheme of things? Um, well, it, it helps them get things that they wouldn't necessarily otherwise be able to trade for. Like uh, some of the farmers um, I met at an event, we did like a press event with the, some of the farmers, and it was like, what are you gonna do with this money that you've gotten back from, you know, from your gems? And one was like, I'm gonna buy a bicycle. 
One is I'm gonna buy a cow, you know? And the other one was like, you know, I, I've got these other things, but I'll, I'll get some gold for my daughter. You know, different things like that. They're not willing, you know, they're, they're very thoughtful about how they're gonna spend this money. And again, it's been introduced in a way that was very gradual and very kind of a secure way. Not like it's the end all of everything. It's just part of the path of getting things that they need, you know, that, that will make their lives easier. Equipment, you hear that a lot. Sometimes I'm going to buy some, a new sprayer, you know, for the plants and things like that. Um, one very, I'll tell you, a very a poignant moment for me was I was doing a press tour with uh, writers from CNN and different places were on this, and we were, we were at this, uh, we were in that grove where you saw the farmers for the award ceremony, and one of the women, I forget where she was, what agency she was from or what press agency, she asked uh, the elder of the, you know, the cooperative, well, now that you've gotten all this money, what are you, you going to do with it? You know, where you're rich, what are you going to do now? And he, he, he just, he thought for a moment and then he answered through a translator. He's like, Madam, we've always been rich. We have the forest. And I just, yeah, I just thought that was such elegant way to do it. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I like to share that with you. So, there you go. Good question. Okay. All right. So, okay, ah, spider graph. This is another way that sometimes you'll see in the marketing that uh, they, they do these spider graphs. And there's an example of a spider graph in your binders too. So, uh, the one on the left would be where the, let's see, one on the left is a microclimate, uh, the second cup that you got, the one on the right is for selection. So selection has a lot of body to it, and it's pretty well balanced between uh, uh, acidity, body, and flavors. Can't quite see on there, but it's called a spider graph. I just thought that was an interesting slide for you. So you can, you can have some fun. There's copies of these in your binders so that you can actually play with them, and you know, next time you have a cup of coffee, just kind of jot some things out and, and see what you think. What's the bottom one? Ah, the bottom one is the flavor. Yeah, sorry, it got cut out with this with this thing there. So you see a lot of flavor, a lot of body, fairly balanced and low acidity. That's the first cup that you had. So it should be very smooth, very caramely cup. Um, and the second one has got much brighter acidity to it. Okay. All right. Some lovely farmers here with their cherries. Okay. And let's see. I like to say that it's passion and motivation um, and just kind of celebrating excellence. Uh, coffee, no matter you know who you are in the world, your, your age, your race, your religion, your politics, your country, people come together over great coffee, which is what we were talking about earlier uh, today. It's just that that's what really brings people together. So, yes. And the Nandi Foundation for all the work that they do. All right. So let's see. Yeah, here we go. I'm actually on cue. How about that? So. Um, coffee brings people together, as you know. Look at us here, right? Nice, diverse group. Okay, and I'd like to say thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you, questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Danny, I have a box there. Could you bring that box up for me, please? That's a special present for someone.
So, uh, again, thanks a lot for coming today, guys. I really appreciate your enthusiasm, your support, and uh, let's rock on. Thank you so much.